5 million years ago, something strange was happening to our ancestors. While every other primate kept its fur, developed stronger jaws, and perfected life in the trees, one lineage was becoming something else entirely. Naked skin where there should be hair. Layers of fat where there should be muscle. An upright stance that made them slower, not faster. These weren't adaptations for the African savanna, where we find their fossils. They look like adaptations for something else entirely. The sea, with traits echoing swimmers, divers, and creatures shaped by waves, currents, and watery worlds beyond the shoreline. Were the oddest primates alive? Line up a human next to a chimpanzee, our closest living relative, and the differences are jarring. The chimp is built for power, dense muscle wrapped around a skeleton designed for climbing, covered in thick fur that protects against thorns, insects, and temperature swings. Their babies cling to their mothers from birth. Now look at us. We're essentially hairless, with only scattered patches on our heads and groins. Our babies are born helpless, unable to hold up their heads for months. We carry thick layers of subcutaneous fat that no other primate has. Our spine curves in ways that would cripple a chimp. We walk on two legs through a world full of faster quadrupeds. We sweat through millions of specialized glands that no other primate possesses in such numbers. The standard explanation has always been the savanna hypothesis. As Africa's climate changed and forests shrank during the Pliocene, our ancestors were forced into open grasslands. There, they stood upright to see over tall grass. They lost their fur to avoid overheating while pursuing prey. Their brains grew large to outsmart predators and coordinate hunts. But look closer at these traits, and something doesn't add up. Standing upright makes you a target, not a survivor. Losing your fur in an environment full of thorns and intense UV radiation seems suicidal. That subcutaneous fat we carry? It's distributed from the fat of savanna mammals, which is stored internally around organs. Our controlled breathing, our downward-facing nostrils, the way newborns instinctively hold their breath underwater. These aren't savanna adaptations. The human body is a collection of features that make little sense for a terrestrial primate. We can't outrun predators. We can't outclimb them. We're born more helpless than almost any other mammal. We need to drink water constantly compared to other savanna animals. Everything about us screams vulnerability on the open plains. Yet, we thrived. The question isn't whether we evolved. The fossil record makes that clear. The question is, what environment could have shaped such a bizarre collection of traits? In 1960, Sir Alistair Hardy stood before the British Sub Aqua Club and proposed something that would have destroyed his reputation 30 years earlier. The marine biologist had been sitting on this idea since the 1930s, too worried about his career to voice it. What if our ancestors didn't move from the forest to the savanna? What if they moved to the water? Hardy pointed out that during the Pliocene epoch, roughly 5.3 to 2.6 million years ago, sea levels fluctuated dramatically. Climate shifts created vast coastal wetlands, river deltas, and chains of lakes across East Africa. These environments were rich with easily gathered food, shellfish, fish, aquatic plants, and bird eggs. No need to outrun antelope, just wade into the shallows and gather dinner. The aquatic ape hypothesis proposed that for perhaps a million years or more, a population of our ancestors lived semi-aquatically, not as full-time swimmers like dolphins, but as coastal foragers who spent significant portions of their day in water, wading through mangroves, diving in lagoons, following shorelines and river systems. This wasn't about becoming mermaids. Hardy imagined something more like the Bajau Sea Nomads of Southeast Asia, humans who remain terrestrial but whose lives revolve around water. Over evolutionary time, such a lifestyle would leave its mark on the body. The hypothesis gained its most passionate advocate in Elaine Morgan, a Welsh television writer who transformed Hardy's tentative speculation into a full-blown theory. Starting with her 1972 book, The Descent of Woman, Morgan argued that the aquatic phase explained not just our anatomy, but our evolution's feminist blind spot. While male scientists imagined Man the Hunter chasing gazelles, Morgan pointed out that pregnant 
pregnant females and children couldn't participate in persistence hunting, but they could gather shellfish, they could wade. Morgan's books presented the hypothesis with compelling clarity. Each strange human trait suddenly made sense through the lens of water. The subcutaneous fat that makes us look soft compared to other apes? That's insulation for water, which draws heat from the body 25 times faster than air. The conscious breath control that lets us speak? That evolved for diving. Our streamlined, hairless bodies perfect for swimming. For the first time, someone had proposed a single, elegant explanation for the entire package of human weirdness. The water had made us human. Look at any truly aquatic mammal, and you'll find the same solutions to the same problems. Water strips away body heat. It creates drag with every movement. According to the aquatic ape hypothesis, humans show signs of developing exactly this equipment. Start with our skin we're functionally naked. The average human has the same number of hair follicles as a chimpanzee, but our hair is so fine and short that they're essentially useless. The only substantial hair we keep is on our heads, exactly where it would serve as a sunshade for an animal waiting with its body submerged. This pattern matches aquatic mammals perfectly. Whales, dolphins, and manatees all lost their fur because wet fur becomes waterlogged, heavy, and actually increases heat loss. The solution evolution found again and again is simple, get rid of it. But losing fur creates a new problem, staying warm. Aquatic mammals solve this with blubber, and humans may have done the same. We carry 10 times more body fat than expected for a primate our size. Crucially, this fat sits in a continuous layer under our skin, not packed around organs like in other apes. This subcutaneous positioning is exactly how seals, whales, and penguins arrange their insulation. The distribution is telling. Human fat concentrates on the torso, thighs, and upper arms, the parts that would be submerged while waiting. Women carry even more subcutaneous fat than men, which would make sense if they were spending time in water while pregnant or caring for infants. Then there's our breathing. Humans have voluntary control over breathing that no other land mammal possesses. We can hold our breath for minutes. When our faces hit cold water, our bodies trigger the mammalian diving reflex. Our heart rate drops by up to 25%. Blood flow redirects from extremities to vital organs. Our spleens contract, releasing extra red blood cells. This diving reflex is far stronger in humans than in our closest relatives. The Beijiao people of Southeast Asia have evolved enlarged spleens over just a thousand years of diving, showing how quickly water-based selection can modify human bodies. Our noses point downward unlike every other primate's forward-facing nostrils. This configuration works like a natural splash guard, preventing water from being forced up the nasal passages during surface dives. It's the same solution evolution gave to proboscis monkeys, the only other primate that regularly swims. Even our babies seem built for water. Newborns arrive covered in Vernix caseosa, a waxy waterproof coating that no other land mammal produces. Infant swimming reflexes are powerful and instinctive. Babies under six months automatically hold their breath underwater, paddle their arms, and kick their legs in a coordinated swimming motion. The brain itself might be the most compelling evidence. Building our enormous brains requires docosahexanoic acid, or DHA, an omega-3 fatty acid that's scarce in terrestrial food chains, but abundant in aquatic ones. Shellfish, fish, and aquatic plants provide DHA in concentrations that would have supercharged brain development. The aquatic ape hypothesis makes a clear, testable prediction. If our ancestors spent a million years living in coastal environments, they would have died there. Their bones would have fossilized there. We should find hominin remains in ancient beach deposits and river deltas from the Pliocene epoch. This is where the hypothesis crashes into reality. After more than a century of intensive fossil hunting across Africa, paleontologists have uncovered thousands of hominin specimens. The famous Lucy skeleton, the town child, footprints preserved in volcanic ash at Letale. Every single one comes from inland locations. The Afar depression in Ethiopia, where Lucy was found, 
was nowhere near the coast during the Pliocene. The fossils lie in layers surrounded by woodlands and grasslands. The animal bones found in the same layers tell the story. Ancient elephants, antelopes, giraffes, hyenas, terrestrial mammals, not marine life. At Olduvai Gorge in Tanzania, two million years of sediments preserve a detailed record of human evolution. The hominin fossils appear alongside stone tools and the bones of animals they butchered. The environment shifts from woodland to grassland through the layers, but it never becomes coastal. No whale bones, no seal remains, no shell middens. South African cave sites like Sterkfontein have yielded hundreds of hominin fossils. These caves formed in limestone far from any ocean. The sediments that buried the bones washed in from the surrounding landscape, a landscape populated by baboons and big cats, not aquatic mammals. Even at sites where hominins had access to water, the evidence points away from aquatic adaptation. At Kubifora in Kenya, hominin fossils are found near an ancient lake system but the isotope signatures in their teeth tell a different story. When animals eat and drink, they incorporate specific ratios of carbon and oxygen isotopes into their teeth. Marine foods leave a distinctive isotopic signature. Scientists can read these chemical signatures like a dietary diary written in enamel. Analysis of hominin teeth from the supposed aquatic period shows none of these marine signatures. Instead, the isotopes match a diet of terrestrial plants, woodland fruits, and savanna grasses, plus the meat of animals that ate these plants. The chemical evidence places our ancestors firmly on dry land. The pattern holds across space and time. From Ethiopia to South Africa, from 7 million to 1 million years ago, hominin fossils appear in terrestrial contexts. They're found with tools for butchering land animals. Their bones show none of the adaptations seen in semi-aquatic mammals. No dense limb bones for ballast, no shortened limbs for swimming efficiency. The absence is damning. Coastal environments are excellent for fossilization. We find fossils of ancient dolphins and seals in exactly the kinds of deposits where aquatic apes should appear. But in all those perfect preservation environments from the right time period, there are no hominin fossils. The traits that make us unique didn't evolve in a single package. Each adaptation has its own story, its own timeline, its own selective pressure. Take our hairlessness. The loss of fur wasn't about streamlining for swimming, it was about not dying of heat stroke. As forests fragmented during the Pliocene, our ancestors moved into open environments. They became persistent hunters, using a strategy no other African predator employed. While lions overheat quickly, early humans could jog for hours. The key innovation wasn't losing hair, it was sweating. Humans have between 2 and 5 million eccrine sweat glands. These produce watery sweat that evaporates directly from the skin, carrying away heat. But this only works if the skin is exposed to air. Fur would trap sweat, preventing evaporation. Combined with bipedalism, which reduces body surface exposed to midday sun, sweating allowed our ancestors to hunt when predators rested. This persistence hunting is still practiced by groups like the sand people of the Kalahari. The subcutaneous fat layer tells a different story, one about energy storage, not insulation. Human fat isn't structured like marine mammal blubber. Blubber is a specialized tissue with densely packed fat cells and extensive blood vessels. Human subcutaneous fat is loose and poorly vascularized by comparison. Our fat distribution makes no sense for aquatic insulation, but perfect sense for other reasons. Women store extra fat on hips and thighs, exactly where it's needed to support pregnancy and lactation. The human brain uses 20% of our calories at rest. Those fat stores are a biological battery, ensuring stable energy for our metabolically expensive brains. Bipedalism itself evolved long before any proposed aquatic phase. Sahelanthropus chidensis, possibly our earliest bipedal ancestor, lived 7 million years ago in what's now the Sahara Desert. The anatomy of bipedalism, the S-curved spine, bowl-shaped pelvis, locking knee, arched foot, these are optimizations for efficient terrestrial walking, not waiting. Our breath control developed for something uniquely human, complex speech, 
the fine control over exhalation, the ability to modulate airflow across vocal cords, allows us to produce the rapid sounds of language. This requires the same neural machinery as holding one's breath, but the selective pressure was communication, not swimming. The human diving reflex isn't exceptional. Rabbits show a stronger response when submerged. Dogs and cats exhibit similar reflexes. It's a basic mammalian response not evidence of aquatic specialization. Even the downward-pointing nose has a terrestrial explanation. The external nose creates a chamber that conditions inhaled air, warming it in cold environments, cooling it in hot ones. This is crucial for protecting lung tissue and conserving water in arid environments. The DHA argument dissolves when we consider what early humans actually ate. The richest sources weren't fish. They were brains and bone marrow from terrestrial animals. Cracking open skulls and long bones with stone tools gave our ancestors access to fatty, DHA-rich tissues that other predators couldn't reach. The aquatic ape hypothesis refuses to die. Despite being rejected by virtually every paleoanthropologist, despite the absence of supporting fossils, it persists in popular imagination. The hypothesis survives because it offers something science rarely provides, a story that feels complete, one transformative phase that explains everything strange about us. It's narratively satisfying in a way that piecemeal accumulation of adaptations never can be. Think about how it's presented. There's a clear beginning. Apes forced to the water's edge, a middle, the transformations of aquatic life, an end, emergence as something new, prepared for dominance. It has the structure of myth, of the stories humans have always told about themselves. Real evolution lacks this narrative elegance. Traits evolve at different times for different reasons. Bipedalism appears millions of years before brain expansion. Each adaptation responds to its own selective pressure, creating a mosaic rather than a masterpiece. The hypothesis also appeals to our sense of identity. We weren't just another plain ape that got lucky. We were the ones who braved the water, became something unprecedented. Elaine Morgan understood this appeal. She positioned herself as the brave outsider fighting scientific orthodoxy. But the most powerful aspect might be how it reframes human vulnerability as strength. In the Savannah Hypothesis, our traits seem like compromises. The Aquatic Hypothesis flips this. We're not failed terrestrial mammals. We're successful aquatic ones who conquered a second domain. The scientific rejection doesn't diminish its psychological appeal. If anything, rejection enhances it. Now it's suppressed knowledge, a truth the establishment won't accept. This is the paradox of the aquatic ape hypothesis. It fails as science, but succeeds as a story. It reveals something important about human psychology. We want our origins to be special. We want a single, dramatic explanation for our existence. The real story of human evolution, written in fossils and isotopes, is less dramatic but more profound. We didn't need a special environment to become special. We evolved in the same landscapes as other African mammals, facing the same challenges. The fossils place us firmly on solid ground. Lucy walked through woodland and grassland 3.2 million years ago, leaving her bones in Ethiopian soil far from any ocean. The latterly footprints preserve a moment, 3.6 million years ago, when three hominins walked across volcanic ash on dry land. The aquatic ape hypothesis asked the right question. Why are humans so strange? But it provided the wrong answer. We're not products of an aquatic phase. We're products of a longer, more complex process that science is still working to understand. The story of the aquatic ape reminds us that in science, the most elegant explanation isn't always the right one. Sometimes the truth is messier, built from a thousand small changes rather than one dramatic transformation. We evolved on solid ground, one strange trait at a time, becoming something no environment could have predicted, a naked ape that would one day look back and wonder how it all began.